My name is Tim Roach. I'm with the Greater Nashville Regional Council, your friendly neighborhood development district. And I, in keeping with the uh, precedent that's already been set, I won't go through the biography of each of the people at the table. I think if you will look uh, through their biographies, you'll be as impressed as I was. We have a great panel put together. I did notice one thing in looking at the biographies, and if you look at mine too, I have discovered the value of a professional headshot. Because it's pretty bad. Dr. Moore was right earlier. In, in my opinion, this is, the, this, is the best, this is the most important session. You've heard a lot the last two days about the whys. And in some cases, the hows of transit planning. This session is going to bring together all of the, all of the uh, 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 information you've heard on health, on economic development, on transportation options, and talk to us about how you actually turn plans into action, uh, either through uh, community design regulations, through zoning ordinances, but especially through the comprehensive plans. The plans are, the, the local comprehensive plans are the place that regional policy has to be enacted. You, you obviously have to generate public support for the local decisions that have to be made on, on whether it's a rezoning, whether it's a right-of-way purchase, uh, whether it's uh, 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 capital funding for a new facility. We heard a few moments ago from uh, uh, Michael Lander uh, his experience on having a, a TOD development that was in line with policy, but obviously the policy hadn't translated itself well enough to the citizens, and, and the community support uh, uh, killed the project. That's what we don't want to happen. We have a bold new vision for mass transit in Middle Tennessee, but it's going to depend on the actions of every, of every jurisdiction around the area to see it take place. This is a perfect opportunity for it as Nashville is working on or is, is gearing up for its new general plan. The esteemed Rick Bernhardt will be producing a plan that will be a blueprint, right, Rick, for, in, for seamlessly melding transit into the document. But we've got a lot of other local governments in the area too on, that, that are going to depend on the same policies to, to help support their transit. To one community, it may be about congestion mitigation and about travel times. To another community, transit may mean opportunities to new markets. It may mean economic development in some places. It's all of those things. How do we as planners, and I'm a planner, I know because I have the lapel pin, how do we as planners translate those different areas of interest down to the specific community level in wording and in a format that communities, the community citizens agree with and that allow the actions to be taken zoning by zoning, site plan by site plan, uh, and a development project by project. So that's, that's the focus I believe we'll have today. Uh, we'll start off with, uh, uh, where are we starting? What we'll do is we'll have each, each of the members will just introduce themselves so you won't have to listen to me anymore. Uh, and at the end, because this is a lunch session and we're down to the hardcore here, we'd like some good Q&A, hopefully some good Q&A. Those of you who are on the ground as either elected officials, community leaders, or planners, which is probably the majority of the room, ask some questions on how we make these things happen community by community to fit, uh, to fit a regional vision. First up is Dr. Uh, Dr. Wendell from the Centers for Disease, Disease Control and Prevention. Doctor. Yeah. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Arthur Wendell. I'm a public health service officer, hence the, uh, hence the uniform. And I work at CDC in a group called the Healthy Community Design Initiative. And I'm, I'm basically here because we in public health are a bit stuck. We've got these leading causes of death, heart disease, diabetes, motor vehicle fatalities, and we need to, your help in order to, to fix some of these issues, just as we turned to public works directors 100 years ago to help us deal with some of the diarrheal illnesses by developing clean water and sanitation systems. So we need your help in dealing with this stuff. So I've got three goals for the session. Um, Number one, this is a lunchtime session, so I'm hoping to be mildly entertaining, but not so much so that I cause you to choke on your food, because that's bad for public health. Um, number two, uh, I want to the, reiterate the point that you heard earlier yesterday, that public transit is good for public health. It helps people get out walking, and people who are riding buses don't get squashed by, in motor vehicle accidents as easily. Um, and number three, 
is that we've got an opportunity to start to think about data systems and how we can bring together the data that's both in the transit side of things um, and the public health side of things together in order to help us with these decisions for our communities. I, and I'm going to introduce the concept of uh, uh, the 10 essential services uh, for public health and show how that can be applied in, the, in this manner. All right. So the reason, the reason why I'm, I'm really doing this, the personal reason, is I, I want a couple of things to happen. One is I want my kids to be able to walk to and from school without being, being um, hurt by a car. And the number two reason, um, they're young enough to like me now, but the number two reason is when they eventually decide to leave the house and, and God willing, have a job and, and be productive citizens, I want them to be able to make the choice of whether they want to take out a big loan to buy a car or whether they want to be able to live their life in a way without having that, that financial burden strapped to them early in life. So those are, those are the kind of the two reasons that, that's pushing me into this, this area personally. Um, my team is the Healthy Community Design Initiative. We're within the National Center for Environmental Health. And our mission is to understand and improve the relationship between community design and public health through very traditional public health activities. Surveillance, um, we work on uh, mechanisms to improve policies like health impact assessments. We work on things like research evaluation and best practice dissemination. So before I launch into the presentation, I want to kind of take us back to my clinical roots and talk about a case patient. His name is Pete. And Pete's a 40-year-old male. He sees his physician for a physical. Anytime you go to see your doc, they're going to make a problem list. Um, so Pete's problems include he's having some difficulty concentrating on work. Uh, he's overweight. His uh, body mass index, or BMI, is 29. Uh, his blood pressure is 137 over 89, which marks him as prehypertensive. He also has an impaired uh, fasting glucose, which makes him uh, pre-diabetic. He doesn't get any exercise, um, and he has some symptoms of depression, but he's not currently meeting any uh, diagnostic criteria. Um, and he has near daily, daily intake of about 20 ounces of cola. So he's got some uh, um, nutrition issues as well. So an, a normal treatment plan, in addition to close monitoring of some of these levels, would be to get some exercise, like joining a gym, um, and meeting with a nutritionist to help, work, help him work on um, his, his diet. So let's say Pete follows those things up. And three months later, there's not been any major improvements, though. That gym that he joined requires about 40 minutes more driving per day, 20 minutes there, 20 minutes back. And that lack of time leads him to, to eat more fast food. So if we follow him out for another 15 years, we find out that he's on multiple medications for hypertension, diabetes, and cholesterol. He's recently hospitalized for uh, chest pain. But if we wanted to turn back time, let's say we have one of these public health and transportation interventions, and say let's... Uh, Let's pretend that a light rail station was constructed about a mile from his home, and he decides that instead of driving to and from there, he's going to walk to the station for his commute to work. So 15 years later, under this alternative scenario, he's walking five days a week to transit and, and rides that transit to work. He's got a longer total daily commute time, um, partly because it's walking, but he doesn't have to go to the gym anymore, so he saves a bunch of time that way. Because of his regular exercise, his BMI is stabilized. Um, and that his regular checkups that he's continuing to get, because he should continue to do that as well, indicates no need for any other medication. And this isn't, this isn't uh, a pipe dream. Um, John McDonald in uh, the American Journal of Preventive Medicine in 2010 showed how this happens at the population uh, scale in Charlotte, North Carolina, when a light rail uh, line was constructed. The reason why Pete's problems are an issue for the U.S. Um, is represented in this graph. In 1960, about 5% of U.S. GDP was spent on uh, medical care costs. Um, by, 20, by 2010 now, it's about 15%. And by 2020, it's going to be about 20%. So we're taking an increasing number of our resources and putting them into, into medical care. And there's other good things to invest in. So how do we go about dealing with these issues? Um, from the public health side of things, we've got something called the 10 Essential Public Health Services. And this is a schematic of how, it's, how it works. I'm not going to take you down to each individual level, but I want to talk about the big picture. Big picture is at the core, we try and make our decisions based on research. So that's why research is at the middle. And then you'll see those three big uh, sections, assessment, policy, development, and insurance. So assessment is where we look for surveillance and data information to help us drive those decisions and maybe going out and uh, doing an investigation to see what's actually going on in, the, in a community. For the policy development side of things, that's where we take that data and research and, uh, and try and translate it into, into good policy recommendations. And then assurance is trying to figure out whether we're actually doing the right thing through evaluation or training and communication. 
So we've already started, I think you've heard about these yesterday, targeting this, this area, this, this uh, area between transportation and public health. And we see this in some of the concordant health strategies. CDC's winnable battles, they allow me to wear a uniform. Um, so motor vehicle injuries and nutrition, physical activity, and obesity are kind of in this, in this link between transportation and public health. Um, the National Prevention Strategy, now that's uh, headed by the National Prevention Council, the Surgeon General, who is actually an admiral, heads that, heads that council. And there's things within the National Prevention Strategy that are essential um, for, uh, that in which dealing with the link between transportation and, and public health is essential in order to meet our nation's public health goals. So we have to have safe and, safe and healthy community environments, and we have to have opportunities for things like active living and injury and violence-free living. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that our group has, has engaged in. And one of those pieces is research. Um, this, is a, this is a not yet published study. It's in press over at the American Journal of Public Health. And it looks at transit walking between 2009 and 2001. And we found using the National Household Travel Survey that there's been a 28% increase in transit walkers nationally. From an estimated uh, 7.5 million people, those transit walkers are people who walk at all from where they live to transit. Uh, 7.5 million people in 2001 to about 10 million people in 2009. And a little less than a million people now walk, um, walk more than 30 minutes per day due to transit walking. So that was, uh, that was, excuse me, an increase of about a million people walk due to transit walking. In 2001, it's about 2.6 2. Uh, million transit walkers, and in 2009, it was 3.4 million transit walkers. That's a, that's, and that's an impactful fact because 30 minutes a day of physical activity, uh, aerobic physical activity, is, allows you to get to the Surgeon General's guidelines for physical activity and, and fitness in the United States. So between 2001 and 2009, because of walking to and from transit, almost a million more people are able to meet that aerobic physical fitness guidelines. And interestingly, we found through other uh, factors that transit walking is associated more with, uh, with uh, rail line systems. We weren't able to look at specific differences with BRT. Other things that we're looking at is surveillance. So trying to figure out how to capture data around these, these issues. Um, a couple of uh, things that we've started doing is one is we've developed with the Alliance for Bicycling and Walking something called the Benchmark Report, which, takes, uh, which focuses on uh, walking and bicycling. Um, and takes data from the transportation, policy, and health realms and puts it together in one spot. And it allows uh, metropolitan planning organizations and states to have that data at their fingertips. Another thing that we're working on in progress is something called the Transportation and Health Tool. And this is a, we're getting started. It's going to be a three-year project with DOT where we're going to look at health and transportation indicators, compile those indicators into, into one place and, and be able to show people in the states and local areas how well they're doing all, all along those specific indicators and link them to potential recommendations for evidence-based strategies. Other efforts that we've engaged in include uh, education. We've got uh, a healthy planning guide uh, produced in partnership with the American Planning Association. Um, if you need to talk to your public health official about why active transportation is a good thing, um, the American Public Health Association and the Safe Routes to School National Partnership produced uh, kind of a, a quick guide on, on to get people up to speed. And we've also done some work within the transit uh, realm as well. TCRP, uh, we've got a chapter in, the, um, in that guidance on bicycling and pedestrian facilities. What we're really trying to get to with, with all this effort is trying to identify those solutions that yield multiple benefits. You know, for us, it's multiple benefits for health, but I think for your decision makers, it's also multiple benefits along the, the congestion lines and along the economic development lines. Um, and I think that those, those, when you can hit those solutions that um, make a difference with multiple outcomes, that, those are the things to strive towards. We have a little bit of problems translating the, the information and data that we have about these solutions into kind of a, a similar language. So for example, from the injury side, FHWA has uh, the proven safety countermeasures, um, which include things like medians, pedestrian refuge islands, um, hybrid beacons, and corridor access management and road diets. Those are all things that can reduce uh, injuries. From the physical activity side, this is something coming from the public health side of things, we've got the recommended strategies from the community guide, and they recommend like street scale urban design and land use policies um, as 
promoting physical activity. But it takes a while before you can actually dive in and find that they're actually recommending the same sort of infrastructure as the, the FHWA. So there's a little bit of translation um, issues between the two. One way to get to those translation issues and trying to put the data together in one spot that we've been working on, something called health impact assessment. Um, there's a formal definition on the screen, but basically I look at it as kind of like a pre-op physical. So before you get your hip replaced or your knee replaced, uh, your physician is going to go through with you system by system, making sure your heart, your lungs, your kidneys are all going to survive the operation because it's not good to die on the table. Um, and you want to make sure that that operation is going to benefit you in the long term. So HI does a similar thing for uh, policies or projects within a community, looking through system by system to, to identify the changes that will occur to, to health from that, inter from that project and be able to make rad recommendations to strengthen those negative, or strengthen the positive impacts and, and mitigate the negative ones. There are other types of health-related assessments that can also draw upon the data. Things like public health assessments, which basically get a landscape of what's going on in the community. It's not directed at a particular project. Uh, a health risk assessment, which is more of a, a post-development uh, type of thing. Um, Cost-benefit analysis or environmental impact assessments can draw, draw health-related data into it. One of the reasons why we're looking at HIA is that it, it looks like it's holding promise for incorporating aspects of health into decision making. It's because it's got an applicability to a broad array of different policies and programs and plans. And it considers both the beneficial and, uh, and negative impacts on, on health. So some of the things that we're currently doing, now I get to walk, this is great. Um, <laughs> get some physical activity while I'm out there. Um, I won't dance for you though. Um, some of the things that we're working on is we, we've got a cooperative agreement with six entities to, to train and conduct HIAs. We're also working with uh, some of our uh, public health partners to be able to put out additional training and some additional opportunities to engage in, in health impact assessments. Um, to support that effort, we're also trying to do things like uh, build the surveillance and build tools so folks can get quick and easy and readily access to the information that they need to conduct it. Uh, we're also trying to track the completed HIAs with partners because it's a lot easier to plagiarize these things and to try and create everything up, up anew. So to be able to pull from the data that they've already had. Um, and to conduct some HIA practice research so we know that when we engage in it, we're actually doing something that's meaningful. So here's a, a map. Um, usually these maps are used for, from CDC from outbreak um, investigations, but this is a, a good kind of outbreak. Uh, this is a map of completed HIAs throughout the U.S. So in 2007, we identified approximately 27, um, 2009, 54. Um, by April of 2012, there's uh, 91 that we knew were completed. Um, and now it's spread all over the place, um, and there's no hiding from it. Um, there's about 208 that are either done or in progress. So two examples of health impact assessment. I'm going to pick one from a small rural community and one from an a urban community to kind of demonstrate that they can be done in multiple different places. Uh, this is a health impact assessment of the Tumalo Community Plan in Deschutes County, Oregon. So a small place near Bend, if you know where that is. Um, and they, the HIA looked at the impacts of the draft uh, Tumalo Community Plan um, and made some recommendations uh, for safety measures for pedestrians and bicyclists who are crossing the Main Street, which was also U.S. Highway 20. And they wanted to, to develop a trail system linking recreational trails um, to both decrease environmental pollution and preserve the natural areas. Um, the impact of this HIA was that the, the comprehensive plan was revised and adopted by the County Board of Commissioners. And some of the temporary recommendations have already been adopted. And what was notable about this HIA, and probably one of the reasons why, why we're here all talking together, is that it, they work closely with the transportation department to make sure all the recommendations that they put forth were feasible. They had some restrictions. They couldn't drop the speed limit too low on Highway 20 because of, uh, it was a state, state highway. Another HIA, the Atlanta Beltline. You've heard a lot about the Atlanta Beltline earlier today, but one of the, there has been a health impact assessment that was uh, examined the effects of building this, this trail system and loop around the city of Atlanta. Um, and one of the, the impacts of this HIA was that 11 of the major recommendations for the health impact assessment was in, were incorporated into the implementation plan. Um, and what was notable about this HIA, which was more comprehensive and, and uh, had a little bit more funding associated with it, was that they were able to track some of those uh, recommendations to determine the impact on the project. 
and that's how we know that some of the recommendations got incorporated. Um, and so it was, a, it was a successful partnership as well between transportation, city officials, and, um, and public health. So here are some more resources for information on health impact assessment should you need um, or, or desire to learn a little bit more, including an online course um, and some of the uh, standards around uh, conducting them. Now, HIA is, is, is one way of getting some of the data um, into, from this transportation and health into some of the decisions ma that we're making. There are certainly other ways of doing it. Um, but what we're going for overall, and what you, what you and I are both working towards, um, is trying to really make a difference at the population scale. Um, you know, transportation agencies are, are usually their mission statement is, has something to do about the welfare of, of people's um, well-being and looking after their, their citizens. And this is uh, something called the health impact pyramid. Um, at the top, you've got things like that uh, a lot of individual effort is needed, um, but there's not going to make a lot of population impact. And education is here, and this is meaning clinical education, so one-on-one -on -one, um, doctor, patient type of education. Um, we, within the health sector, can get down to that long-lasting protective interventions when we do things like vaccines. But really, when we're trying to, to really make a difference at the population scale, we've got to get down to closer to the base, and that's around changing the context to make individuals' default decisions more healthy. And the way to do that is to make sure that people, when they go out their door, they can choose easily to, to, to walk to transit or to walk to some other destination, rather than having them fear for their lives in, in making that decision. And if we do it in a way that we're also benefiting uh, socioeconomic factors, um, we can really build the foundation to promote uh, the public's welfare. Thank you. Does it work? It works, it works. Before you start, I wanted to ask one question, Dr. Wendell. Uh, the health impact and assessments are, uh, that are they scalable, obviously, to different, to different levels, whether it's a regional uh, uh, planning process you're looking at or a community or even a neighborhood level planning process? Yeah, they, they certainly are scalable. We've seen them at, from the federal level, really, down to the, the very local level. Um, and they're scalable in terms of amount of uh, resources uh, to, to put into them as well. Uh, one of the reasons I ask is we use a lot of, uh, in planning, we use a lot of sometimes modeling, but a lot of times just simply charrettes, hands-on work experience and looking at uh, uh, different design options and different ways that uh, a corridor, for example, could be laid out. Could the health impact assessment also be brought in at that same time and become one of the metrics used to decide between alternatives? Yeah, certainly. And there's, there's different, like I mentioned, there's all other things besides just health impact assessment to, to, to consider as well. Um, we, we developed for charrettes um, and have been piloting, um, and they're available on the website that I showed, a, kind of a, a community design, a healthy community design checklist to, to use with the charrette process, just to make sure people are covering kind of the, the big areas of public health as they're thinking about the design of something that's going into their, into their community. So things like air pollution, injury, physical activity, um, as, a, as a short trigger for people to, to think about. Um, you know, Getting, getting health, into, health considerations in, HIA is, is, is one tool, and it's a good tool in many places, but it's not necessarily the only tool of doing it. So trying to figure out exactly what's going to work for, for your particular project um, may require a little bit of thinking, but there's different, there's different scales of effort to put that in. Well, absolutely. I, th I think what, what's intriguing about the health impact assessment, at least it allows you to try to quantify. Uh, things that you might not other, otherwise quantify, and those of us who are planners in the room, we know that all planning in Tennessee is based on the public what? Health, safety, and welfare. So the first two are, are integral al already to this part of the discussion, and that's why I'm, the impact assessment, again, is a way to, to quantify a number, but it's also a way, I think, to bring the health and safety part of planning back integrated better with, 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 with other types of, of, uh, of the land use development transportation policy. Robin? Thank you and uh, good afternoon. Have we, have we made it past noon? Yes, we have. My name is Robin Hutchison. I'm the transportation director for Salt Lake City, Utah. 
Uh, you have a number of tidbits of information about me in your packages. Uh, one other thing I'd like to share with you is that I'm a planner who's in charge of transportation for Salt Lake City. I'm the first planner in charge of transportation for Salt Lake City. I'm also the first woman in charge of transportation for Salt Lake City, and I think those are both interesting facts that I want to share with you before I start talking. <laughs> no, don't do that. Please, please, hold your applause. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you about implementation, uh, what we're doing on the ground there. I want to get a sense for my crowd and my audience. I find that many people that I speak with have never been to Utah, so show of hands, have you been to Utah? I'm very impressed. So you know how beautiful it is. See the picture here. What a lot of people don't know is that the city of Salt Lake City is only 180,000 residents in a valley of approximately 2 million people. But we are the capital city and our population nearly doubles every single day with a work commute pattern in and out. We are set on the foothills. You saw the mountains in the background, that last picture. So we have a mix of urban and suburban landscapes and we have an urban and wildland interface on our borders. Um, I think you heard from Matt Sybil that we were a geographically uh, constrained region with mountains on one side. Uh, we value our natural spaces uh, and we've made decisions, I'll tell you about those in a moment, uh, how to protect those natural spaces. We still have within our metropolitan planning organization areas, uh, rural landscapes that look like this that require painstaking preservation. And we have a growing and vibrant downtown with active transit and walkable urban environments. We are a mix of urban, suburban, rural landscapes in the region. Salt Lake City is the most urban in the area, uh, but we still have challenges that are very relative to suburban and uh, rural communities as well. Another show of hands, if you've been to Utah, was it for skiing? Okay, several. This is coming down from Alta Snowbird area here. This is what it looks like in the winter sometimes. This is a massive inversion in the valley. 70% of this is mobile source emissions. That's driving. We're growing. We're going to have a lot more people in this valley by 2040. We all know what happens. You've heard this before. And miles, population goes up. Miles go up. We have to do something about the problem, and we really do. We know we can't, same, I heard this already twice today, you cannot build your way out of congestion. We have a regional plan to handle this, and we are working on this. This is called the Wasatch Choice for 2040. This is developed based on Utah values, based on a series of public opinion surveys, countless, I, I don't know how many evenings I spent going to meetings on this, countless public meetings to measure the values of Utah. What do you want? And as you can imagine, someone said earlier, uh, we're a spot of blue and a sea of red. I think we're the most Republican state, maybe the most Republican state in the country. But our citizens came out and said, we want to protect our quality of life. And so we are willing to consider something different. And what you see here is that linear uh, pattern that I showed you before with spots of development. Urban center, there's really only one. There it is, Salt Lake City is the regional metropolitan center. That serves a lot of the jobs of the region. It's the only color of blue in here, so we are the one major metropolitan center. But we are, in our suburban areas, looking at more compact development. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip that. So our, our transit system, which I believe you heard about yesterday, mirrors this. Again, that linear pattern. We're here, Salt Lake City. Everything is coming in and out of Salt Lake. We are the destination for UTA's 2015 program. I use this to illustrate the point that we in Utah have done a lot of what, we, uh, what we've done so far through partnerships. Um, we are the des Salt Lake City's destination for the UTA 2015 program. We talk, I, I mean, I have, a, I have daily conversations with several of their staff. The, uh, Wasatch Front Regional Council was the developer of that Wasatch Choice for 2040. We all work together on a daily basis. We can't do this without, without the partnerships. 
Our trends in Salt Lake City, we've just completed a short analysis of what's happening in the city, and you know, we are finding we are no different than the region, so we've got to do something. Our distribution of trips, the, the green and the purple there, that's what we really want. Those are our, our alternative modes. We need to grow this, and by 2020, personally, I'm not seeing the needle move quite as much as we want to, so what do we need to do? Our mayor, Mayor Becker, is very, very smart. And he has put forward a set of policies. So this is the first of a couple things that I'm going to talk about of what we're doing as a city to implement transit. First, policy-based. One, six key steps to create a livable community in Salt Lake City. And Salt Lake City in motion, that one, that one's kind of my responsibility. There's a motto, drive if you want to, but it shouldn't be your only or your best option in town. This is a little unpopular, as you can imagine, when this came out. Uh, but we're sticking to it. We can't continue. We don't, we don't have expansion possibilities for our roads. We're going to stick to this. So you hear the snickering from the public. They don't like hearing statements like that, but when you go out and you ask them, would you be willing to raise taxes for trails and pedestrian amenities? They say yes. And would you be willing to raise taxes for a streetcar? They also say yes. So we know that this is what people want. I'm going to tell you later about a really successful public process. It's successful because we go out and we ask and we understand what people want and then we try and tailor our solutions to that. So there's a few components of this and I'm going to weave through some implementation as I talk about this. Salt Lake City in motion, we're working on transit. I loved that a few different communities showed their historic networks. This is our historic network. 144 miles, now we have zero and one mile under construction at the present time. Uh, we we want to get back to this, even if it's not 144 miles, I mean, every neighborhood in the city is connected here. So back to this transit map, uh, Sugar House Streetcar, this was awarded a Tiger Grant a couple years ago and we're, we're working on it uh, right now, it is under construction. It connects uh, east-west sort of a rare thing right now, the east-west connection from tracks on the left-hand side and in the light blue shaded area is the community of Sugar House, aptly named the Sugar House Streetcar. Each of those yellow dots is development that is either under construction or is about to be under construction and there's about $400 million mixed-use development either under construction or in plants. Now, one of the reasons this was successful is that in 2006, the Sugar House Neighborhood Master Plan was updated. And in it, it upzoned most of this area in light blue. And that started to become very appealing for the developers. Uh, maybe four or five years ago, we took a trip. I can't underscore the importance of picking communities that resemble what you want to be and visiting them. So we visited a few communities and we took the developers and the lenders with us and the result is they got excited to build mixed use development. The third piece of this is the community has been saying for 15 years, this is what we want. Can you please help us make this happen? So it really started with them. We have underway right now at each of these stations, you'll notice that these station areas, uh, not all of them are in or near that light blue area, so we have some work to do and we're working on an overlay zone around the transit areas that will allow uh, a higher, higher density. It's form-based. Uh, we're working quite a bit with form-based code right now and that's underway so that we can promote the development around each of those stations and not just at the end of the line. This was the vision. This is what we're working on. We're including, similar to the Beltline, a, a greenway associated with it. We had 66 feet of right-of-way in an existing corridor, existing freight corridor, abandoned. Uh, and we're using part of it for the streetcar and part of it for other modes of transportation. So a couple design pictures right now. That's what it was. This is what it looks like right now. This is very exciting for us. This is a symposium about implementation. This is fun. We're doing this. We're implementing. Uh, I got a hard hat. It lives in my car. Sometimes it lives on the back of my bike. Uh, and we're out here every week looking at more progress. 
We're also working on a downtown streetcar. Uh, this is our next project to get streetcars on the ground. Uh, we've done a fair amount of groundwork here with the, again, starting with the local community. We've done the groundwork to talk to the development community, to talk the, to the community councils and the neighborhoods that are surrounding here. And we know that this is desirable. We know that these, are, that these routes are desirable and we're now entering into a more formal alternatives analysis process. We were awarded a grant from FTA last year and we'll be starting next month on an AA. So that's streetcar. That's one component, increasing transit. It's one component of our Salt Lake City in motion. But we're not gonna have successful transit if we don't do some other things too. And you've heard a lot about this. We need to increase safety measures for bikes and pedestrians. The way this plays out in city government is we have to codify this. It's really easy to say, we need more bike lanes. And it's a lot harder to do it when you have to say, we need more bike lanes at the expense of your travel lanes. So unless you've got some teeth in your code, in your ordinances, it's really difficult. <laughs> Europe is definitely a long way ahead of us, but not everywhere in Europe. There are still some places where we're, we're doing a better job. Uh, we don't want this, right? We want good design. We have a complete streets ordinance. Any cities or towns here have complete streets ordinances adopted? You got a couple, that's great. That helps tremendously. Every time we go to reconstruct or improve a street, that ordinance requires us to accommodate bicycles and pedestrians. So why is this important? It's important because if we really wanna move the needle and shift from single occupant vehicles, which I've heard this morning, we all wanna do that, driving to transit is not the most effective way to do that. So we've got to get the alternative modes connected to transit. This is Main Street in Salt Lake City. We completely reconstructed this in the 1990s to include a complete street, wide sidewalk, multimodal facilities. This is by the University of Utah, installing more buffered bike lanes here. We've got our first cycle track project, which actually puts the, the uh, the cyclists on the inside of the parked cars, this connects directly to downtown and directly to a light rail station. This is just my favorite picture to show everybody about how you can put multimodal transit on your street. This is from Berlin. Got to do the same for pedestrians. I'm going to talk more about this in a minute. This is uh, North Temple. Our complete streets ordinance kicked in again here on the facilities. This is a super wide sidewalk. Um, we've got eight to 12 feet throughout the corridor, uh, 12 feet in a lot of locations for sidewalks. And we've got, you can't see it too well in this photo, um, but we have great pedestrian and bicycle signals here. Uh, we're putting the infrastructure in to really protect the, pe the pedestrian. Um, as well, we just went through a, a huge upgrade of our wayfinding downtown, and this helps people when they're getting on or off the train to know where they're going to walk. This is also part and parcel of complete, uh, completing the street so that we can improve the access to transit. <coughs> How am I doing on time? Good. Two more minutes. Okay. Great. All right. So here's one case study I'm going to walk you through that assembles all the pieces. We're going to talk about the airport line. Again, here's your locator map. This is wholly in Salt Lake City, a partnership between the Utah Transit Authority and Salt Lake City. <coughs> I know you were, you were anxiously awaiting this zoning map. Right. Everybody likes the zoning map. Um, what we have done here is implemented, and this is adopted already, a transit station area zoning district along this corridor. And this is a form-based code, and this allows the uh, flexibility in development. Now, I'm just going to touch on the process here because that's what made this successful. Talked about it a couple times already. This was a 15-month process with the community. There are over 1,900 parcels that were upzoned as a result of this process, and not one negative comment or complaint to the Planning Commission or the City Council when this was adopted. And the reason this was successful, and I'll tell you, not every, I'm giving you a success story. Every city's got some, some things that didn't quote, go quite right. I'm not telling you about those. I'm telling you about the good one. Uh, over 1,900 parcels upzoned, um, and uh, Countless meetings, stakeholder meetings, one-on-one -on -one meetings, community meetings, every meeting was out on site, and the community had a hand in developing what they wanted. What this zoning allows 
developers to do is to trade out and trade up. So if a developer meets all of the criteria of the form-based code, all of the positive things that we want to see out there, you get additional height. So the base height uh, in that first tier of the wedding cake around the transit, set, uh, transit station is between 65 and 105 feet. But you can get an extra story on that if you are willing to improve the sidewalk, the streetscape, reduce your parking, install bike racks, and do, do a number of things that make it a better, uh, a better development for Salt Lake City. Uh, the other thing it does is um, you can expedite your permit process, which I think is a huge carrot for developers. Um, so this is, uh, this is one of the um, success stories for Salt Lake, um, a visual simulation of what we anticipate this is going to look like. Uh, this is 65 to, to 105 with those extra stories. It is being constructed as a complete street. So here we're putting some pieces together. The complete street ordinance kicked in. We got the infrastructure we wanted. And our zoning ordinance now has also kicked in. And we're, we're hoping to get the development that we want. This one is also, again, very exciting. Under construction. Looks like this right now. You can see uh, just the left-hand corner there. Uh, this is starting to work. We've got development uh, coming in now uh, the way that we want it to. So being transit ready, I heard someone use that term already today, partnerships, city policies directed alternative modes. Transit isn't going to be successful unless you're delivering your people. Um, investment in the infrastructure for transit, uh, progressive zoning. We're having some really good luck on that North Temple corridor. We're trying it again on the Sugar House corridor and we are uh, looking to do this citywide as our fixed uh, guideway system gets more robust. Um, and then the developer interest, the over $300 million of investment, um, bringing, bringing our developers with us on this journey. Thanks very much. That's what I have for you today, and I appreciate you being invited to talk. Hi, thank you for having me today. I am Jennifer Hillhouse with the City and County of Denver. I'm a transportation planner um, and been focused a lot on the fast track system that we're going to talk a little bit about. It's our rail program that's coming into place and will be um, developed and implemented by 2016. So our real focus in Denver, if I can figure this out, is, is moving people. Um, we, we have uh, several plans in place that look at, you know, um, moving people, more people similar to what Robin was explaining, and I think most cities face this, is that we have more people going places more often. Um, traffic j congestion is increasing where our lane miles are remaining the same. And we actually have policy that says they must remain the same. We're not going to expand our road footprint. Um, so what does this mean? That delays continue to get longer and increase. Um, we see, you know, that transit is a very integral um, point to quality of life and um, more more Americans are relying on transit to get around. A third of Americans um, do not drive. 20%, 21% of those are over 65. Um, all, of course, all of our children are 16, and it sounds like, you know, from other presentations, that's even increasing with um, older children not getting driver's license. Uh, many low-income individuals uh, who cannot afford automobiles. So these are people that we need to plan for and accommodate. We have several plans in place that um, allow the framework and the basis for our transportation policy. The Denver Comp Plan kind of sets the vision, um, the, the overarching vision and goals for the city. And all these plans kind of play in place, so they're built upon each other. The Blueprint Denver is a supplement to that Denver Comprehensive Plan and really began to integrate transportation and land use, something that's very important to consider. You can't look at one without the other. Greenprint Denver began to identify our sustainability goals. Um, and the strategic TOD plan gave incentives and identified opportunities for developers to begin to plan um, and develop the city in a quality and sustainable way. The strategic transportation plan, or the STP as we call it, and I'm going to get into more um, detail on this, is really, is, it's a multimodal plan um, that really set the policy for Denver. Living Streets Initiative, um, very similar. I think it's interchangeable, complete streets and um, looking at uh, allowing multimodal aspects to your streets and not just considering one over the other. The new zoning code, so similar to what Robin has mentioned too, we went in and we looked at 
Um, how can we upgrade our zoning? How can we make it easier um, for developers to come in and build the way that's sustainable and provide that quality of life around our new stations? And of course, the strategic parking plan. We heard a lot about parking. This is always not the, the best, the you know, most sexy, I guess, topic to talk about. And a lot of people get upset about it because they want to be able to drive and park um, where they're going. And so we looked at where are ways to manage that? Can we share um, parking facilities? So it is a 24-hour service that we're looking at, you know, daytime office use with um, the, the bars and other restaurants. And, and can we look to combining those facilities? So the STP, uh, this again set our transportation policy for Denver. Um, it's multimodal at its at the basis. It looks at not only pedestrians, um, bicyclists, transit, and then of course the vehicles. We always have to remember to to move the vehicles as well. Um, looking at safe and efficient, reliable transit um, that's well connected. It's green and sustainable, um, and which will result in a healthy, livable communities. So our approach on innovation, what the STP allowed us to do is look at, per, at person trips rather than vehicle trips. VMT, as planners, we usually look at VMT, and we found, let's look at how people are actually moving and not um, just vehicles. So you can see in this picture on the left that that's a roadway that's filled with vehicles, and it's to its capacity. You take those same people out of their cars, and you see how they're distributed over the roadway. Um, not very efficient not very sustainable. You take those same amount of people and you put them in a bus. You can see the efficiencies already. And same thing with a complete streets, offering pedestrian and bicycle friendly streets. Um, now they're distributed evenly, it's sustainable, and you're using um, your facility a lot more efficiently. We also looked at travel sheds instead of corridors. I think traditionally we look at corridors, we look at a roadway and see how it's functioning. Um, but we identified and realized that you've got to look at a, a larger area to understand how the transit is performing, how the bike, bikes are moving in the area. It might, it might not make sense for every corridor to have a bike lane on it. So you really need to look how are people moving in a, in a large geographical area. So our strategy was define, to define future transportation options, um, looking at our studies and our um, master plans to do this, providing multimodal improvements, uh, maximizing efficiency and safety, and then obviously maintaining the existing infrastructure we have today. As we add to it, we need to always check back and making sure that we can um, maintain what's out there. We, it's very important to balance our operation, physical, and behavioral improvements. And you can see the behavioral change once you do focus on the operational and physical improvements. We have, as I mentioned, um, the RTD, the Regional Transportation District, has implemented a fast tracks program. It's a rail um, program, 122 miles of commuter rail and light rail, um, 18 miles of that are BRT, and uh, several are already in place and under construction, and we'll get into that in a little bit more detail. But I think this slide just wanted to make the point that it's very important to look at all of your efforts together that if you, when you have a rail program, looking at those stations, um, we have a Denver Moves, which identifies all our bike network um, and really expanding that. Um, our pedestrian master plan, which identifies the need for sidewalks. So looking at these comprehensively and trying to make sure that the connections are in place and are seamless, and that will make for a viable transportation system. So getting a little bit more detail on the fast track system, this, um, is a voter approved initiative in 2004. Denver voters approved um, the Fast Tracks program, which again is 122 miles of commuter rail and light rail. It connects eight counties, so it's region wide. Uh, 32 of those miles are within Denver, and we have uh, three new stations. Several of the stations are already in place, and we have a central commuter rail line, and um, that's downtown. But this is our new system that's coming in, and something that I'm very familiar with and have been managing for the last five years for the city. Um, and realizing that those plans in place, uh, my job would be so much harder working with the Regional Transportation District if I didn't have that framework that was provided for us. Um, we're able to, on the ground, make decisions, and our IGAs, our intergovernmental agreements, um, ensuring that they're, the vision for our city is being met and that future improvements are not precluded. So in addition to all those plans I mentioned, we also do station area planning 
Um, so for those three new stations that are coming up, and you see several other, there's eight station area plans that have been conducted, and these really set the policy and the vision um, for those surrounding areas give us the um, understanding of how to move forward. They identify and prioritize short-term and long-term improvements. And um, so one of those is the 38th and Blake station area. And I'm gonna kind of highlight these two station areas. These came out of our TOD strategic plan as the most viable um, stations to um, identify and implement TOD. So they're very industrial in nature and um, just had the most possibility. Although we anticipate and we will plan and try to do everything we can for all of our stations, these were the ones that were identified as the best investment um, for now because of their character. And so because the rail lines for fast tracks are mostly focused on the freight rail corridors, they all share um, the existing freight rail. So they go through very industrial areas. Um, they have communities, but in their nature, they're industrial. So these places were not designed for people. They were not constructed for people. So a lot of work on the city end um, to make sure that these stations are not islands and that our communities are connected through bicycle networks and um, sidewalks, um, pedestrian bridges and such. So this station at 30th and Blake, this is our first station on the East Corridor right outside the city. Um, you have several barriers. There's the railroad. Um, I think they're seen as maybe barriers and opportunities. The river um, is very difficult to get across. It's mostly industrial in nature and the character along there. And then, of course, I-25. Um, so lots of need for connectivity. And what are we doing? All of these, are, these um, list of projects have come out of our, our plans that I listed for you, mostly the SDP and our station area plans. Um, so sidewalk improvements, we're implementing 2,000 linear feet of sidewalks in the area to connect our communities, Cole and um, Whittier, as you see on the map, um, to the station, which is identified with the, the yellow T. Major drainage improvements, um, the area had not seen, because of lack of development, had not seen any improvements. We're even looking at innovative ideas of open channels, um, working with the developers to realize this and, and provide an amenity to the community roadway improvements, um, not only, oh, thank you, um, roadway improvements, you know, as I mentioned, we, we try to stay within our footprint. Um, of course, if there are safety implications, we, we do go outside of that footprint, but meaning here um, is, is the complete streets initiative. It's putting in sidewalks and tree lawns and um, streetscaping. Uh, medians when needed and so really looking at ways that we can improve our gateways into the community um, bridge improvements there is a very severe um, approach that it's very unsafe for our community to cross over into the station and so we're fixing that that's happening today um, as we speak that construction is happening um, there RTD is building a stationary pedestrian bridge uh, to allow people to get from you know, one side of the railroad tracks to the other. In addition to that, we're looking at two other pedestrian bridges um, that would serve the community maybe a little bit better as well as another bridge over the river so that you have a complete access point um, from the river all the way to the station. These things are very important to the community and the developers and I think even present a great opportunity for public-private partnerships as we move forward with the, the lack of funding um, because we have not funded the bridge over the Platte river or that second pedestrian bridge so looking for innovative ways and um, park improvements as many people have mentioned that's really important to um, activate your neighborhoods and station areas and TOD um, so parks department has purchased several acres of land along the river um, and will be in line with those pedestrian bridges that are planned the city also has an ordinance of 1% art funds so any um, city investment over a million dollars must provide 1% of art and that can be within a mile of the project. So the hump, as we call it, the Blake hump, um, that severe approach uh, of the bridge that I was talking about, um, that is over a million dollars. Of course, it's close to $8 million, and 1% will go in, back into the community. 41st and Fox, very similar in nature. You have industrial on one side, on the east side, and then the existing community um, to the west. We're working on a bike ped bridge across a major arterial um, that will connect people to the station. Um, and this is also enhances our regional bike trail, its connection from our bike trail. And 
furthering on Incas, the street that it will be on, um, is a multi-use path. So again, incorporating our complete streets initiative and our stationary plan um, to make that street livable and sustainable. We're also doing drainage improvements. RTD is required to do a pedestrian bridge to connect our community, and these were all things that are identified in our stationary plan. Um, so through the negotiations with RTD, it had been very difficult. Um, we wouldn't have had much leverage or standing if those things weren't identified as critical needs and um, opportunities. So it's also important to look at that long-term for, um, for short-term. As we're doing these incremental projects, I mean, we, I think the city is, not only do we not have the funding, but it's not our sole responsibility. You know, we don't go out and develop and, you know, working with the, the developers. So understanding that, that final vision, um, but as we do incremental projects, so sidewalks and pedestrian bridges, ensuring that we're getting to that ultimate um, vision. I think one example of this is that one of the station area site plans that RTD came to us with at first um, did not meet our grid. It was the, the roadways, internal roadways to their site were not on our grid system. And so we saw that this had lacked the opportunities for our developers to come in and provide TOD in the future. So we required them to have big blocks of land and their, that their internal network would meet um, our grid system to allow for that. And so what are we doing in the future? Um, oops, sorry, you can't go back. Um, we, we will continue to look at implementation options and partnerships and funding. Um, we, and you know, cultivating those partnerships with RTD and HUD um, and developing those projects that are on the shelf ready to go. So as grant funding is available, we, we know what we want, we have a level of design um, and we're ready to implement. So that's all I had for you for today. Thank you very much. afraid to touch the clicker. Oh. Good afternoon, my name is Sean Vroom. I'm with the New Jersey Institute of Technology, and I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit today about a study that we're conducting for Federal Transit Administration. Uh, but before I do that, I just wanna thank uh, Mike Skipper and uh, the Nashville Area MPO for inviting me to be here. I do appreciate it. Let's see if I get this right. All right. Uh, before I get into the details of the study, let me just give you a little bit of a background on who we are and how the funding for this study came about. New Jersey Institute of Technology is a public research university located in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, the funding for this study was provided through uh, an earmark in Safety Lou and ultimately through Federal Transit Administration to the university. So what is transit supportive development? It's, it's a different approach to planning, one that integrates land use planning and transit. Uh, it describes uh, a type of development that can support transit and in turn be supported by transit. So what's the difference between TSD and TOD? Uh, I mean, we all know what TOD is. It's basically a high density <coughs> mixed use uh, type development located within a quarter mile, half a mile of a public transit station has public amenities. Transit supportive development is a broader approach to basically the same planning ideas used for TOD, but we're taking into consideration issues at the corridor and the uh, regional level. So the basic principles of transit supported development are that convenient access uh, to transit is or can be a key attraction to foster mixed land use development, and that increased development and mixed uses uh, in station areas not only uh, supports transit, but also accomplishes other goals, including uh, reducing sprawl, uh, reducing congestion, uh, increasing pedestrian activity, uh, economic development potential, and environmental benefits. So the basic premises of the study uh, that we've conducted is that public transit can play a significant role in the creation of a sustainable transportation system uh, and sustainable communities, but only if the transit investments are supported by compatible land uses and policies. So planning for uh, the other premises that planning uh, for transit investments and planning for local land use uh, developments occur at different scales and at different uh, jurisdictional levels in that 
and at different times in that those bridge, uh, we need to bridge the gap that exists there. So some of the challenges that are uh, facing transit supportive development are the disconnects in the planning process. Uh, there's operational silos among many of the parties involved in this type of development, which lead to a single focus criteria and decision making. Uh, there's structural challenges uh, that include the absence of local plans and zoning ordinances that supports uh, transit supportive development, uh, especially um, in mixed use and higher densities. And the timing, typically, for a transit project, the, the planning occurs years and years before the transit system ever becomes active. The local land use planning process occurs typically two or three years before, and sometimes it happens after. And it, basically, that's the time frame that we have to we have to stop working around. Everybody seems to sees transit supportive development as kind of the last step in the process, and it really needs to be engaged earlier on, much earlier on. So, what's needed? Tools and resources. Uh, for MPOs, regional planners, transit planners, and local governments to integrate planning and land use planning, uh, transit planning and land use planning. So there's two products that are coming out of the research that we're conducting. The first is the, is, uh, the practitioner's guide, and the second is a web-based tool. The practitioner's guide essentially is a toolkit of best practices, uh, guidance, success stories, uh, useful techniques and transferable examples, lessons learned on how to link transit investment uh, planning with local land use planning and the benefits that can be realized from this. Um, it's also to provide tools and resources for three distinct levels of planning, regional, corridor, and local, while demonstrating the need to coordinate the planning and implementation efforts of those distinct levels. So some of the sample topics that are included in the guide include a uh, need for project champions, um, transit supportive development regulations and funding, economic and environmental benefits of transit supportive developments, case studies for transit corridor planning, and case studies for transit station uh, neighbor and neighborhood planning. So that's the guide. The web-based tool, which it was always intended to be seated within, uh, is comprised of three components. The first is the practitioner's guide. The second uh, are the corridor and the station neighborhood case studies. And the third is the transit supportive development database. Now the practitioner's guide, the way it differs from say a hard copy version is the, the guide itself is well over 600 pages and we don't expect anybody to ever read it from cover to cover. We wanted to make it as user friendly as possible. So by embedding it into a web based tool, what we, what we can do is we provide high hyperlinks throughout the document so that you can move not only forward and backward but horizontally through the document uh, as well as to the other components of the web-based tool. So for example, if you're reading the case study on Portland Streetcar and you come across a reference to Streetcar and you want to learn about more about Streetcars, you can click on that link. It's going to take you over to the premium transit mode portion of the guide and you can read more about Streetcars. So that's the guide. The case studies are essentially, they're included in the guide, but in the web-based tool, we're going to break them out and they'll be searchable. It'll be a simple drop-down menu. You'll be able to uh, go in, pick the one that you want. You'll be able to read about it. And similar to the practitioner's guide, you'll be able to navigate through them via hyperlinks that are going to, again, take you back to the guide or back over to the Transit Supportive Development searchable database. Third component is going to be the Transit Supportive Development searchable database. And what this is is a collection of transit supportive developments that are referenced in all the case studies that are included in the guide as well as others that uh, are notable throughout the country. Let me see if I have my... So you'll be able to go into the website and you'll click on transit supportive developments. <coughs> and what you'll get is a page that has a search, has parameters that you can input. So if you're looking for a specific transit supportive development of a specific size, um, use mix, floor area ratio, density, you'll be able to click those parameters and you'll get a list of, of transit supportive developments that best meet those criteria. Then you'll be able to click on any one of those that you're interested in learning more about and it's going to take you to a report page on that transit supportive development. And on that uh, report page, you're going to get information, so again, such as the uh, density, size of the site, uh, floor area ratio, how parking was handled, what uh, special zoning was implemented to assist in the development of the site, things of that nature. You're also going to be able to go and look through a collection of images so you can get a good idea and feel for what the site looks like. And then you'll be able to go into uh, a Google Earth Street View link and it's going to take you 
right to Google Earth Street View of the site. You'll be able to experience the site kind of virtually by moving, navigating through Google Street View. And then if there's a 3D warehouse representation of the site, you'll be able to take that off the site and move it on to Google SketchUp. And if you'd like to manipulate on a site of your, your own choosing, you'd be able to do that. So where are we in the process? We've already, uh, we field tested the document. What we did was we, through DVRPC, that's the Philadelphia MPO, they organized five user or focus groups um, that were willing to review the practitioner's guide. Um, so what we did was we sent them out and we gave them assignments and it was, it, we really, it was quite an undertaking. I mean, the document is literally, it's that thick. Uh, they went through it, they gave us, we had uh, conference calls with them and we garnered their input as well as their feedback, comments, and we've just completed incorporating as much of those uh, comments and feedback as we could into the guide. Uh, and it's currently going through an editorial and uh, design review. So once that's done, um, we're hoping to get our end of it done by the end of this year. Uh, at the same time, we're, we're also developing and, and completing the web-based tool. The web-based tool can't be completed until we get the guide sections completed and they go through a final FTA review. So that's everything I have uh, for you today. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them uh, at the end here. And what I'd like to do is uh, introduce Barbara Jones. Bridget. Bridget, I'm sorry. That was real close. I think we're going to, we may lose a couple of our panelists before too long because they, they say they've got flights that have to go out, I don't know. Uh, so anyway, before, before Bridget uh, proceeds with her part, I wanted to see if you had any questions specifically for, for our out-of-town guests uh, on, any of the, on any of the topics that they presented so far. I'm, maybe I'm a planning geek, but I really like this New Jersey Institute of Technology tool. Does this sound great? Does this sound great? Planners, we gotta, we gotta jump on that. Anybody have questions for any of these panelists? In the back, yes. Industrial land tends to be in larger parcels or easier to redevelop than that sort of fragmented parcel um, issue that we talked about earlier today. Can you kind of touch on how actually siting these in industrial areas might be beneficial for redevelopment? Yeah, it's a, it's a really um, interesting way to look at it because I think a lot of times people say, well, the stations aren't in the communities, they're not connecting to the community, but I think that's a great advantage um, that we have um, by not only kind of consolidating our rail and transit facilities, um, but also looking at uh, changes, areas of stability, as we call them, and areas of change. So the stability is the communities that you saw, the single family and uh, multifamily residents. Um, but in these larger parcels, we have seen um, lots of development opportunities, lots of interest from developers, and even those parcels um, they are large and they're assembling even larger areas so that they can um, provide parks and really start to create communities. Um, so I think it really does offer, you know, we have streetcar going on on Colfax and um, light rail within our downtown area and you're very limited to right of way. So this gives you the opportunity to really look at TOD um, and reality and that's why we're focusing on 38th and um, 41st as kind of the first get-go because we really see the need for infrastructure but then also that development is coming and will continue to. Um, my question is directed towards Robin but I guess anyone could answer. You mentioned that a lot of it, the success came on the communities actually wanting asking for, for these types of projects. Um, and most of us are pretty aware of Salt Lake City's um, great reputation for uh, this type of stuff, but could you maybe explain a little bit? Because I feel like here in Tennessee, um, our local and state officials uh, want, to, want, want to do these great things, but they're maybe not feeling that demand out in the community. And 
if if there was more of that, I, I feel like we could progress more. So could you maybe explain, you know, how the history of that and and sure. why these communities are demanding it in your area? I'd be happy to uh, give you my perspective on it. Um, I'm new to this this job as transportation director, but I was in, I've been in Utah for 18 years, so I'm, I've watched a lot of things evolve, and it was a much different place when I got there 18 years ago. I think the key and the turning point for Utah was the Wasatch Choice for 2040 process, which spanned from on the north and Ogden to the south and Provo and even beyond a little bit, um, a metropolitan region of two million people. That process wasn't just to go out and listen to what the people want. There was quantitative data and information that was developed to exemplify four different growth scenarios from the least compact to the most compact and all the choices that go along with those. And that study, I have, I'm happy, if, if I get your permission, I'd be happy to send you some of the value studies that were done. But what that quantitative information did is said, you will gain back 20 more minutes a day with your family. You will save, you know, $100 a month. You will, and it put it into terms that everyday people can understand. Oh, if we make a different choice, more time with my kids, more money in my pocket, you know, really, what more do you need to sell beyond those really core values? So I think it began with that, and we keep using that as a touchstone. We did an initial one in O. O2, we updated it in 08. You know, we, we keep using that as a touchstone, both the quantitative information as well as asking what are your values and let's match your values. Does that, does that help? Do we have any other questions for, before we, hey, Gary? The uh, charts that you show always just shock me, and I think uh, on the amount of money that we're spending on health care and, and, and how it's growing on preventable diseases. And I'm wondering, I was um, excited to see here that you are working, CDC is maybe working with the DOTs on some planning practices, but could you postulate on the possibility in the future of linking uh, transportation infrastructure based on the idea of saving at the end of, um, you know, health treatment and, and somehow or another putting that into real investments in infrastructure that are, are more significant as a preventive strategy. Yeah, I, I think that um, I, we'd love to be able to build some of those, uh, those, those modeling techniques to be able to link infrastructure goes in and predict how much healthcare savings you're getting. Is that that's sort of the things that you're getting? Yeah, there's. I think that there's going to be um, a, there's going to be a couple of challenges. One is some of those health outcomes have so many different confounding variables that, that go into there that you have to kind of be able to sort out those other confounding variables as well. So take obesity, for instance. That's that's something that has a lot of different inputs into that system. But there's other variables, or there's other health outcomes like physical activity which is more directly tied to some of the transportation choices. And then you can take, um, like, physical activity, begin to see how much um, cost savings you could potentially have with that amount of physical activity that's generated. Um, the World Health Organization, for instance, has looked at something called the Health Economic Analysis Tool for Walking and Bicycling. And they've been able to generate, uh, using a, a study based in, in Copenhagen as the, the primary data source, um, to put in if people walk X amount more um, in, in a city, how much uh, mortality cost is, is saved. Um, so it's not, it's not considering the, um, you know, some of the, the cost of treating diabetes, it's just considering the cost of uh, the people's lives being saved. Um, and that generates some fairly big numbers for the, um, for the trips that are generated. Um, so that's a health economic analysis tool for walking and bicycling that the WHO uh, put forward. Um, and I think that those, there's opportunities to take some of the work that's being done over in Europe on these issues and use uh, U.S. studies um, and translate them uh, to, to the U.S. population. Um, so that, some of that stuff has, has started to happen. Um, and I think that there's an opportunity to look beyond just um, that health outcome to potentially other health outcomes. But the first thing we have to have to do is be able to kind of build the research to, to make the link effectively um, and to 
capture the data um, within individual cities of, uh, to, to be able to run those models. So we don't know in a lot of cases where people are walking, how many trips are being generated, for, for, for example, through walking and bicycling. Um, so when, those, when that data systems are um, developed and implemented more, more fully, then we can be, begin to, to answer some of those questions. Thanks. <clears throat> any, other, any other questions for these panelists? Uh, Bridget, bring it home. Thank you for allowing me to be a part, and congratulations to all of us and all of you that have attended this marvelous, marvelous event. Michael, thank you. It's been great. Um, I want to do three quick things to wrap this up. First of all, I want to give you a little background and share with you information on a new Tennessee Regions Roundtable Network that Cumberland Region Tomorrow, in partnership with a lot of groups, is setting up to assist us to share information, build our capacity, and support for successful visioning, planning, and implementation that fulfill the Federal Sustainable Community Partnership Principles which we've renamed Quality Communities Principles, which align with our Quality Growth Principles that we've been working with here in Middle Tennessee. And then conclude to show you uh, how we're talking about what's going on here in relationship and sharing with the other regions. And then finally, just give you an, uh, an update on some new planning tools and uh, case studies and communication tools that we are developing that will support your efforts in your communities in our region. So I don't know if y'all know it or not, but Tennessee's famous in the country um, because we're a southern state that is doing some terrific work certainly here in Middle Tennessee is illustrated by this event and our progressive movement toward implementation of regional transit but also the circles on the map show you the Memphis and the Knoxville regions who obtained region, HUD regional planning grant in 2010 and 2011 that allow them to do the same things we're doing to create coalitions, do a visioning scenario planning process, work on comprehensive planning and development both at the regional and the community level, and to move into implementation. So we've got two regional grantees. We're doing our stuff here. Joe Barker left, but they have a robust regional economic development institute in the Jackson, West Tennessee region that we can borrow from that's working on regional economic community development in a rural region, human capital development, and entrepreneurship, wealth creation. So they are partners. And then finally, the Chattanooga region is self-funding a regional coalition visioning, planning, and implementation effort that's called Thrive 2055 that's going to take that region through similar steps we've been through into implementation along many of the same lines that we've committed to here. TDOT is recognized nationally because before their leadership with the last administration and this administration with what Ed and Tokes and the others are doing with multimodal transportation and rebalancing of funding and support for this range of transportation investments that we want to see happen that mirror our MPO. So again, we're, we're ahead on that. And then we're also ahead with some foundations and some other groups that believe in our work that have been investing. So all that said, allowed us at Cumberland Region tomorrow to connect with the Serdna Foundation, which along with Ford and Rockefeller are three of the large national smart growth funders to come into Tennessee to help us create this network that connects public, private, and philanthropic groups to support our successful implementation. The purpose, and many of you all heard about this at the summit, is just to bring together these groups to uh, support our efforts across our diverse regions, to advance our local, regional, and statewide quality communities, principles, and practices, to share knowledges and resources to build our internal and external capacity along the lines of New Jersey, and then just to educate and communicate and collaborate in support of our regional and statewide objectives. As we get into this, let me let you hear for three minutes a quick word from our partners, and then I'll, I'll go through the rest of the presentation quickly. But this gives you some insight to let you know that we're not in this alone. There's a lot of support for this across Tennessee. They will be talking to those three questions. Michael. Casey. If it doesn't work, I can tell you what they're going to say. Uh, let me do that. Um, basically, 
going back to the questions, we had Joe Barker here from the Jackson region that left, and he was speaking about why regionalism was determined important in that region and how they've been working together for three years to build this institute in this capacity. Tokes was videoed as the co-chair of our state advisory group, that's okay, Michael, uh, talking about the leadership that he's given at TDOT and why creating sustainable communities and regions aligns with their efforts, and we've heard a lot from TDOT leaders today in support of our work here, so they know we're on our side. It's okay. It's okay. And then the third question was from our partners in Chattanooga at the Southeast Tennessee Development District, Beth McClure, who was talking about, again, the benefit of sharing across our regions to help us all be successful, but also to know that we're not the only people doing this. So again, your work to bring in the national experts and our leaders from our peer regions has been really helpful. Uh, but that's the uh, background of how we were able to uh, bring everybody together to apply to CERDNA to create the Tennessee Regions Round table. We all agree on the same goals that we have in Middle Tennessee to advance prosperity and our economic competitiveness and job creation, to increase our livability by focusing on community uh, quality community developments with a range of choices in transportation, housing, workforce, etc. And then to make sure that we maximize and the wise use of our fiscal and land resources, which of course transit does. Um, quickly, who's involved? This is a two-year project to set up a network among our regions, but also a group of um, a dozen state advisors that are forming an advisory committee. I'll show you the, those groups in a minute. Funders from the regions that are investing in the nonprofits and the community level work, and also a beginning look at the affiliate organizations, money, many that we've heard from here today and yesterday that are involved in this. Um, quickly in the regions, going from Memphis, it's real interesting because we've got ULI and sustain, the Office of Sustainability in Memphis and Shelby County leading that region's effort. The Southwest Tennessee Development District, a strong organization in the Jackson region. In Middle Tennessee, already we've partnered with GNRC, the National MPO, and the Northern Middle Tennessee Economic Development Group. Uh, Southeast Tennessee Development District, Plan ET, uh, the TPO from Knoxville, Joe is here. So again, it's all of us working toward the same ends. And how we talk about the work in Middle Tennessee and what we're sharing with the other people illustrates how well we're doing in, in aligning our regional planning with our local comprehensive plan to support our success. So again, the work of these organizations and many others that have put this on are allowing the other partners from the state to see how we did a visioning process with Fred and Nessie, like Envision Utah, and quantified this difference, and then how we have uh, settled in on this better scenario like you produced, and now how our regional transportation vision looks a whole lot like the, our dream for the future. And now finally how through the leadership of many of the planning directors and the local officials in the region, we've got a lot of action completed and underway to update that local land use comprehensive planning framework that is supporting those communities' goals, but also will create a framework to support our regional transit investments. Imagine this map this way. We've got uh, comprehensive plans completed in Murray, Rutherford, Sumner. We're working on some others in Robertson and some other counties. And envision the map with a star in Sumner County, Gallatin for Greensboro North, a star in Lebanon, Wilson County for Hamilton Springs, a couple of stars for Davidson County and Williamson County for complete streets policies. Again, lots of robust planning action that's creating that local level framework that will support our regional work. And there's lots of people involved with lots of groups that have partnered to help in the quality growth work that we've been able to, to partner with many on to do with your leadership at the community. The current CRT quality growth projects are what we're helping with is Robertson County is doing a comprehensive plan that's looking at supporting their ag economy but also supporting future transit investments with community revitalization. Cheatham County is doing a sustainable tourism economic development strategy that's looking at opportunities in Ashland City and Kingston Springs for future transit.
The Nashville General Plan, Rick is leading a marvelous effort that's going to inform our whole region to support transit, but also our economic development, open space, and equity goals. In my hometown, Columbia, we're doing some terrific neighborhood revitalization from our comp plan that we're starting to share with other communities. And then finally, even Fort Campbell is interested. They realize their role in the region. They want to understand how to connect to the regional transit plan, but they're also looking at some in-based things that'll help. So again, a lot of support in Middle Tennessee to work on the comp plan piece, and we're sharing that with our other region's partners. The state agencies that are involved in the round table, you know them, many of them have been here, but again, a robust uh, group of of state agencies led by T. Dodd and Tokes, his group, to support this effort and our efforts. Uh, we have the affiliate category. You heard from Jeff from Smart Growth America, the T for A people. There's many other affiliate groups that'll come into this work that are working with each region. Certainly, Michael, again, you brought them in for us this week. But again, just organizing that outside help. And then finally, just organizing funders that care about this, that want to invest in this with us in West, Middle, and East. So, it's really an opportunity to connect and leverage what we all have to advance ourselves and our work more quickly and to also create a common group and a, a broader coalition of support that will help us in Middle Tennessee achieve our objectives but also support the other regions of the state which ultimately will make Tennessee stronger. So we've got a lot of partners and members. Um, and then again, the actions to, uh, to wind this down are just to, to create this network, local, regional, state, and national, and leverage it to our benefit, to make sure we share our resources and expertise, to advance our work, to increase our own regional synergy and capacity and synergy, internal and external, um, share, advance, communicate, support, and then that will position Tennessee, hopefully, as a leading southern state so we remain famous so we can continue to get money uh, to be successful with implementation. But again, the goals to advance our economic vitality and prosperity, our livability and sustainability for the statewide network are the same that we share here in Middle Tennessee. Quickly, uh, the tools you'll be able to access. We are creating a Tennessee Regions Roundtable website, much like yours in New Jersey, that hopes who's doing what, what are the best practices, what are the case studies, what are the tools and resources we can share, and how can we support each other to go further, faster, more successfully. We are creating a communication and messaging strategy along the same lines of how we're talking about this here today. There'll be an expanded quality communities education series that builds on our quality growth toolbox, the Chattanooga Region's natural infrastructure toolbox, a new complete streets toolbox, some reinvestment readiness toolboxes, and we'd love to uh, bring in the TLD stuff Gary Yard doing, just as, as another tool. So again, the idea is to capture, organize, present, get it out to elected officials and communities so we can all be stronger. And then finally, best practices and case studies. We have a lot in our region that we're trying to tell with our partners, but also the other regions have a lot. So if we so let, so let successfully capture those, share those, we're going to look at the funding incentives too, state level, bringing them down to the region and the communities to make sure the funding flows down to support our efforts. I was thrilled with Tokes' statement yesterday on the alternative transportation. That's critical. So we want more state agencies to focus and leverage their resources. And then finally, again, just the network to understand who's doing what and share and to replicate is really the end goal. So hopefully for you all as community leaders and planning professionals, design community professionals, and people that have been working on this in Middle Tennessee a long time, we should feel good about where we are. We should feel good about our, our reputation and our connection and people willing to help us. But we also should feel good that there are other people across Tennessee that are working on the same things, that if we all come together, we'll be stronger. So again, uh, we'll announce to you all in Middle Tennessee as these new things become available. You'll see case stories about yourself. But again, just a chance to be here and thank everybody for their leadership and good work and to invite you all in to be a part of this as we create this for the state. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones. I see we have not lost any of our panelists. Uh, the fact that I chained you to the floor doesn't have anything to do with it, does it? 
You want some lunch before you leave, too, don't you? I, I know. So if you have questions for the panel, let's hear them now. Raised hands. Then I hope you'll join me in thanking all of these people, including all of our speakers. They've done a wonderful job. And you know, if this, if this symposium were a commuter train, the ITS would show just a slight delay, but I think we've done pretty well here. We're wrapping up about when we're supposed to. All the presentations, all the PowerPoint presentations will be made available on the Nashville MPO's events site, on their uh, events page, on their website. Uh, other than that, on behalf of the Nashville MPO, the Transit Alliance of Middle Tennessee and, and the Middle Tennessee Mayor's Caucus, I am pleased to announce us adjourned. <laughs>